Hey there, Biohacking Village. Thanks for this opportunity to speak today. My name's Kwadi, and the name of my talk today is There and Back Again, a Healthcare Cybersecurity Policy Tale. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. A little bit about myself before I begin. Uh, first and foremost, I'm, I'm a hacker, so I grew up in the hacker space. I, I go to hacker conferences. I really identify with the hacker mindset, and I use a lot of the same skills and tools as hackers to do my day job. Uh, which is actually being an emergency medicine doctor. So uh, most of the time when I'm at work, I'm in the emergency department taking care of all sorts of sick patients that come to me, whether or not they be having heart attacks or strokes or having severe infections like sepsis or over the last year and a half or so been having uh, COVID infections. Uh, really combining those two worlds was something that I've had the tremendous honor of being able to do. So I am both a hacker and a doctor combine those together uh, it really guides my research. Uh, so I do some active research on medical device vulnerabilities, hospital infrastructure vulnerabilities. And the point of that really being, I care a lot about patient privacy and security, but I care more about uh, their health and safety and that cyber attacks, including ransomware attacks are impacting my patient's health. And I wanna study that. I'm also unapologetically a geek. Uh, yeah, sorry, not sorry. You're gonna see a lot of geeky meme references in my presentation, and uh, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to deal with that. <laughs> My Twitter account is at CDMFMD. Hit me up if you have questions. So when contemplating what to speak about today, I had a lot of different things I could go over. I could talk about some new research that came out. I could talk about some new aspect of the problem um, that people might not understand from a clinical workflow situation. But really, uh, the more and more I thought about it, the more I felt kind of hopeless. And it's that the problem has not changed much since we started talking about this, right? Hospitals are still under attack. In fact, the ransomware attacks of the last several years are increasing in frequency, sophistication, disruptive potential. That's not going away. Uh, and then medical devices, you know, there has been a lot of work done by the FDA. I see maybe a shimmering uh, glimmer of hope in the future for uh, really improving the medical device um, cybersecurity posture. But with that being said, there's still a lot of operational issues, a lot of problems with legacy medical devices. And as a consequence, what we have is pretty much the same damn conversation that we've been having uh, for the last 10 years on this. And um, what, what I wanted to do with this talk is to say, okay, well, uh, we've admired this problem uh, so long. We've danced around some potential solutions. Most of those uh, we say are a call to action, you know, do something about it. But what are we talking about would be required to actually make this problem even a little bit better at a scale that would matter. So I hope today to talk a little bit about maybe moving in a little bit of a different direction and realizing that um, although it's very important for hackers uh, in the community to get involved, we're only so, we can only do so much. And truly we need to be talking about really big solutions uh, to try to move this needle. So I think to reframe the problem is that we're continued, we're continually having these issues and uh, not having a much improvement. We're pissed off and we're tired. Um, and that's a, a dangerous combination uh, to have people not care about this problem as much as they should. And you could ask a lot of people in this space, I think they feel the same way. I mean, they work so hard to try to move the needle and uh, it doesn't really work. So the other thing to say is, well, hold on a second. Is this even a fixable problem? And I think that the answer is, of course not. You know, you can't fix cybersecurity vulnerabilities. That's not the nature of the problem. There are going to be inevitable flaws in hardware and software uh, that are going to allow for vulnerabilities and exploitation of those vulnerabilities to change the function of a system to where it wasn't intended. So this discussion that, you know, we need to finally push this boulder to the top of the mountain and then we'll fix this issue and we can move on is one that is just not based in reality. Instead, what we should be understanding is that we have a particularly vulnerable uh, set of circumstances right now that we need to fix. And then we need to establish sound policy and a good foundation to not fix this issue of healthcare, cybersecurity, or vulnerable medical devices, but to instead be able to reduce the risk to an acceptable level uh, so that we can take care of patients 
um, patients to get the care that they need, you know, in a hospital, in their clinic, wherever it may be. And the risk of a large cyber attack disrupting that and impacting their safety or their data is greatly reduced. So what is that going to actually require? It's not going to be a fix. We're not going to finally do some legislative action or finally some hackers are going to stand up and it's going to be fixed. Instead, this is going to be something we're dealing with with a very long time. And if we actually take a little bit of an outward gaze of it, uh, we could fix a, a vast majority of the problems we have now. Of course, there will be new ones, but then we have to really look at a global approach and understand how uh, we tackle this issue, not just in the United States, but across the globe. That's also a very, very hard problem. So uh, a little bit of a continuation of the we're pissed off and we're tired. But I think if anything, it should encourage us to be renewed in our uh, enthusiasm to try, try to make this problem at least a little bit better. One of the first things I wanted to bring up, you know, quite frankly, is that we have very little data. This is a problem. You know, we can't make meaningful decisions and really get to the heart of an issue if we can't even measure how big the problem is. You know, there are uh, many possibilities in this. One, that uh, the data, if we had it, would show that cybersecurity risks to patient safety and care quality are overblown. That's a possibility. Um, and that all of this energy and uh, time and technology and money that we put into trying to make this problem better could actually be better spent by giving it to cancer research, for example. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that uh, there is much um, patient harm going on, right? There's, uh, to the degree that we don't even understand uh, and currently can comprehend, there may be drastic impacts to patient safety and care quality to where this is a really meaningful thing to focus on and to work to improve. The truth probably lies somewhere in between. But again, if we can't even collect the basic data, uh, we can't even measure the magnitude of the problem. It's unreasonable for us to expect to have a decent solution. What is that going to mean for us moving forward? Well, we're going to have to collect that data. There are a lot of problems with that. First of all, uh, when I went to go write a paper, I went to go see if there was a centralized repository or a database of ransomware healthcare attacks. Right? I want to see uh, really how prevalent this was. And most of what I was getting are industry reports. You know, there are companies that have a vested interest in selling products and services around ransomware protection or response or mitigation, whatever it may be, and uh, that they use uh, their methodology to try to extract the magnitude of the issue. And um, it's better than nothing for sure. But what I would suggest we need is a more rigorous approach to collecting this data, a more academic and scientifically validated process why, wherein we collect even something as basic as uh, how many hospitals are getting hit with ransomware and what are the impact and magnitude of that of those attacks. So the first thing I'm going to kind of throw a wrench into here is the discussion of whether or not there should be mandatory reporting. This is not a easy thing to suggest or uh, it, is so obvious a solution to our problems. Instead, it's just a first step into discussing, you know, would something like if you're infected with a ransomware at a hospital, you have to report to a centralized agency, you know, for example, when you were hit, when you fully recovered, uh, what you were hit with, and perhaps if you paid the ransom and how much. Those basic demographic type of things um, aren't present. And I think what we should be focusing on is how can we encourage an environment where reporting of this isn't disincentive, disincentivized. What do I mean by that? Because ransomware attacks involve often protected health information, uh, many hospitals immediately after being hit by ransomware do not discuss the specifics of the ransomware. They're trying to recover, they're trying to negotiate potentially a ransom payment, they're trying to shore up their systems, uh, they, and they are also afraid of a uh, violation of HIPAA and a big fine. Those are all kind of a perfect storm for uh, hospitals and other health organizations to not want to have to talk about this. So how do we destigmatize this as well as allow an environment where reporting isn't seen as such a negative thing and said the value of the data is so important that it's self-evident that people should report? And if that doesn't work, you know, how do we compel organizations in a uh, give and take way 
to report that. For instance, discussions of safe harbor or anonymization of data to a meaningful way, we hospitals to get assurances that they won't be identified if they report that particular information. But even something as basic as that would go a long way for us to record and then measure the impact of cyber attacks in healthcare. The other thing I'm gonna say is that it's very clear that in addition to ha having a lack of just very basic information, we do not have a research infrastructure in place to study this. What do I mean by this? Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, these are horrible, horrible pathophysiological conditions that result in lots of morbidity and mortality for uh, human beings across this entire planet. There are organizations, government organizations that fund research into these types of diseases for the purpose of alleviating human suffering and death. What does that mean? They invest in researchers to actually study these phenomena, these particular diseases. Well, my second call here, and perhaps not too much of a controversial one, is really that these types of agencies, the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, should prioritize funding into this, not just by giving dollars and cents, but also to encourage researchers across the United States and globally to actually make this an area of study. Uh, if you go and look at the research, you go, go into PubMed and start looking into the patient care implications of cyber attacks, you're going to find a handful of papers if that. That's amazing to me. We see this on the front page of magazines almost every single day, newspapers, magazines on the internet, almost every single day, healthcare ransomware, healthcare cyber attacks, medical device vulnerabilities. But yet our infrastructure, our scientists at the heart of being able to study a problem like this aren't focusing on it. And I think that's a missed opportunity. So my call is, is then to develop a funding stream for research and encourage researchers across the globe to actually study this. This is a paper that we published discussing how cyber attacks are like disasters for a hospital. Uh, hospitals prepare for certain disasters as part of being a hospital. If there's a hospital in Tornado Alley, they have a plan for what happens if a large tornado is around them or if a tornado actually hits the hospital. If they're in an earthquake zone, they have the same. These types of hazards to the hospital and their ability to take care of patients and do business um, should take into consideration cyber attacks, and many of them do. It's become so prevalent now that many forward-thinking hospitals are preparing for cyber attacks like disasters. This is a relatively new concept. And why am I bringing this up? I've talked about this in other forums before. Of course, it makes sense. Cyber attacks can be so debilitating to a healthcare organization that, of course, they can look like disasters. But the point of it is now we're learning something new. Cyber disasters impacting a particular hospital hit with ransomware, for example, is one thing. What happens to the care of patients at that facility where they don't have an electronic health record or they don't have medical devices such as CT scanners, whatever it may actually be, there's the impact of patient care at that specific hospital or hospitals that are hit. But now we know something new. It's truly this concept of this healthcare ecosystem. Unfortunately, 2020 was such a horrible thing. 2021 is shaping up uh, to not be uh, much better, but we learned something here, which I think is important to point out and is very obvious uh, when you think about it. So hospitals and other healthcare organizations, we'll talk about a slide in a minute about what this healthcare ecosystem is like, they form symbiotic relationships. And so what happens to one affects the other. This makes sense. Well, let's talk about that in the concept of a ransomware attack. If you have a, a metropolitan area taking care of 5 million people, there's going to be a finite number of hospitals and other healthcare facilities in that region, right? Well, uh, not every hospital is equipped to take care of every type of patient. We have trauma centers, we have stroke centers, we have uh, cardiac arrest and um, heart attack centers that focus on particularly sick patients and specialize in their care. And furthermore, there's a finite number of hospitals to take care of all the patients, but we don't have redundancies, meaning we don't have backup hospitals if things go down. What we learned uh, with a recent ransomware attack was that five hospitals in a geographic location went down. And then all the adjacent hospitals to that system that went down had to pick up the slack. They saw huge influxes of patients to the emergency department. 
they saw huge increases in the amount of ambulances that had to come to their facilities. They saw increased numbers of strokes and heart attacks. What does that mean? It means that even if you aren't hit by ransomware, because of the healthcare ecosystem, you can still be impacted. What you should take away from that is that care can suffer across a geographic area when one healthcare system of many goes down. We should realize that we're only as protected as our least defended communities, meaning one hospital might invest a lot in cybersecurity, one may not, but it matters that they all do because what happens at one will affect the other, as wise Obi-Wan here said. It's not just hospitals. You know, we had this miracle, um, you know, I'm not religious, I mean like a spiritual or religious miracle, but I mean, we had this amazing thing happen where the, where COVID happened and we were very quickly able to develop a vaccine for it. That's amazing. That required a lot of science, research infrastructure, drug development, and uh, logistics to, to actually make that happen in, in the short amount of time that it did. That was to respond to a crisis. And what I think it shows is that, of course, that makes sense that there are so many pieces of this healthcare ecosystem, all of which are running vulnerable uh, connected infrastructure. And that if something happens at one part of the ecosystem is going to affect the other. If the researchers uh, doing COVID research and developing that vaccine were hit with ransomware, even a delay of weeks to months in that regard would have resulted in millions more dead. Um, and likewise, with things like PPE production, et cetera, it's a very complex and intricate web. And what we should realize is that we really have a bigger problem than just biting off medical device cybersecurity or just talking about hospital infrastructure security and ransomware resiliency truly to truly make a resilient and um, capable healthcare system we have to raise the bar for everybody this is the concept of the cyber haves and have nots i've worked in all of these hospital types of hospitals i've worked in uh, hospitals that are very poor that have no resources, they don't have two nickels to rub together, they, have, they don't have the latest connected medical devices, they have old antiquated electronic health records, they have very vulnerable infrastructure. And I've worked at other facilities that had marble floors and um, were very well resourced and, and uh, could take and have, the, and have the expertise in house to do a decent job of cybersecurity. These hospitals can be across the street from each other sometimes. Or in the case of rural uh, hospitals or critical access hospitals, sometimes there's only one hospital near you and the next one can be 500 miles away. What we truly really have are cyber haves and have nots in healthcare. And what we need to realize is that we need to raise the bar for everybody because one affects the other. And it's just the right thing to do. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish something like that, given that that's a pretty tall order? Well, um, perhaps the second thing I'm going to talk about today is to say I've really seen recently that we need to engage this at a, at a national policy level and that we could continue to try to solve this at the micro level, and that will be a big important thing. We're going to need hospitals to step up individually, of course. We're going to need medical device manufacturers to continue to do that clinics, et cetera. We're going to need the private sector to help accomplish that. But I think I'm thinking more and more, uh, I'm convinced that we're going to need some real national legislation on this. And what would that look like? And how would we be able to do this in a way that's actually effective and not counterproductive? When I thought about that, and some other people have been talking about using this mechanism to do such a thing, um, I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention here and to discuss what something like this might look like. And what many people are talking about and what it reminds me of is something called the 2009 High Tech Act as part of a large investment um, in America. There was a big spending bill and part of this was this High Tech Act. At its heart, it was designed to improve electronic health record adoption among healthcare. It did many other things, but just the, at the heart of it, that was one of the biggest things it tried to do. So what do, you, what do you mean? In 2009, we had a bill that said hospitals should be off of paper records 
and be an electronic health records? The answer is yes. And prior to that, many hospitals and healthcare systems um, were still on paper, in, even in 2009. And so many people are shocked to find that like, well, I don't go, I, every hospital I engage in now is on electronic health record. Well, it probably was because of this 2009 high tech act. And there were people and uh, there were hospitals before that had electronic health records, sometimes over a decade, but it took this legislation to really catalyze the change. There are reportedly, though there were three stages to the legislation and basically stage one, was data capture and sharing. Stage two was advanced clinical processes. And stage three was to try to leverage all that technology to improve healthcare. The thought was, is that electronic health records are much better than paper. They're more efficient. Uh, we can save money by sharing records. There were lots of reasons why the United States would care about uh, making sure our hospitals were on electronic health records. Uh, and it did a good job in doing that. Now, there were a lot of failures, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute, but one of the things that it succeeded in was at least offering uh, carrots, you know, this concept of carrots or sticks. You want to incentivize people versus penalize them as a way to catalyze change. What they did was they would increase the amount of money that the federal government would give them for certain uh, Medicare funding uh, for patients. So for example, uh, you have Medicare, you go see a hospital, and if they met um, stage one, they were self-certified that they met this level of electronic health record use that satisfied stage one. Well, then when they send a bill to the federal government for your health care, uh, the government would give them a little bit extra because they met this particular standard. So that was the parrot. If you go to an electronic health record, you meet these types of standards under stage one or stage two or stage three as time went on, uh, then we're going to give you a little bit more money. Well, that was thought to be a way to incentivize the hospitals to do that. They'd get these incentive payments and they could use that to pay back the investment that they made in the electronic health record. And what was realized is that we can't keep giving money out for everybody for, for this type of stuff for in perpetuity. So it transitioned from a carrot to a stick and where, uh, wherein as the years moved on, you'd get less and less money. And in fact, at one point it flipped and said, we will give you less money taking care of Medicare patients uh, unless you're on electronic health record. And um, that was successful in a lot of ways of making hospitals and healthcare organizations go towards electronic health records. There were a lot of failures. Uh, some people cite the involvement of vendors in this, uh, diluting the recommendations. Some uh, cited uh, failures in clearly defining interoperability requirements. And long story short, despite its failures, it was successful in catalyzing change. The question is, can we use this model as a way to improve healthcare cybersecurity in some type of legislative action? So the thought is, is this something that could pass? You know, could you get the House and the Senate to agree on a bill? And could you get the president to sign something that would improve meaningfully the cybersecurity of healthcare? And could you do so by using this type of stages, meaningful use type model? So none of this, um, to my knowledge, is very public or exactly what would potentially end up in a bill yet, I think is still being figured out. But the thought would be something like staged approaches. You know, you can't take a rural critical access hospital that has basically no cybersecurity protections and expect them to have a high level of protections in a year without substantial uh, internal investment, uh, money, as well as expertise, which we've talked about time and time again, we just really don't have a lot of healthcare cybersecurity expertise. So you can't do that overnight, but the thought would be that you could do it in stages. And perhaps you um, list a bunch of controls. You can say, hey, multi-factor authentication is useful in, um, in protecting some of these types of attacks or reducing your risk. Perhaps multi-factor authentication will be on a list of certain controls um, that could uh, be part of a stage one, uh, satisfying a stage one. And then stage two may be a little bit more stringent. Uh, you move towards a, a better architecture, for example, or you would adopt additional controls to continue to harden your infrastructure. And then stage three, of course, 
hopefully meeting some really meaningful defensive posture for hospitals, as well as have built in the appropriate infrastructure at each individual healthcare delivery organization so they can continue uh, defending, updating, patching, learning about the latest vulnerabilities and defending their enterprise, essentially. Um, there has been thoughts, you know, about self-attestation, you know, auditing hospitals and healthcare delivery organizations that say, yes, we meet these certain benchmarks. Um, and then if you get audited and you actually didn't, then perhaps you could suffer some tremendous fine. Um, could we use incentivization, incentives, should we use incentives like CMS monies, right? So uh, should we say you get more money from the government for every patient you take care of with Medicare if you're particularly secured? Uh, a very controversial one, but one I want to bring out is that uh, perhaps we use this type of legislation to also provide some type of safe harbor or protections for certain data breach implications. And I know that's very controversial, uh, but let me just hear me out for one second as, as a potential mechanism to incentivize hospitals to do this. If a hospital was to meet a certain criteria of cyber safety or cyber security protections, and then they still get breached, right? They have a, a state actor or um, a zero day hits them uh, and they have loss of patient records. The thought being because they met certain benchmarks that were clearly defined by the law, should they still be liable for uh, HIPAA fines under OCR, for example? And some would say that that would be uh, incentivizing of hospitals to do this, if they could say, we met a certain standard, we had this particular type of attack, uh, and we shouldn't be fined the same amount as if we had uh, not invested in cybersecurity at all. Um, and then perhaps to further um, incentivize hospitals to not pay fines, but use that type of money to reinvest back into cybersecurity would potentially be another carrot to offer hospitals to do this because it's clear that such a endeavor as this would be tremendously expensive. I think it's clear that many people who would say the government should fund something like this would probably also say that we should have the same uh, carrot eventually turns into a stick and that certain hospitals that don't meet standards eventually uh, should have some disincentive for continuing to do that. Could you tie uh, this bill uh, into other types of in additional efforts uh, outside of this meaningful use framework. Yeah, you could, there's been uh, Jeff Corman and others have discussed this concept of a cash for clunkers for old medical devices. We have this big legacy medical issue, medical device issue. How do we just get those out of circulation? The thought would be that you could subsidize the cost of buying new, more secure medical devices and turn in your old ones. Uh, could also be a part of such a legislative action or a legislative bill. And then I think it's clear, and you've probably heard me talk about this previously, it's clear that we need to educate nurses, doctors, technicians, other people in this space about healthcare cybersecurity, not only for a, um, an issue of patient safety, but also for data protection. You know, they're users of this technology, and they're often responsible for these breaches through phishing attacks, et cetera. That was a lot. There's a lot of things in here, I think, that will be um, encouraging of a further dialogue and conversation. You know, there'll be uh, many people on the spectrum. One, the private sector can solve this uniquely. Two, hospitals are overregulated. Why would you encourage something like this? Three, uh, this isn't uh, improving. We need something else to spur action. Uh, I hope that this talk was a um, was received in a way to spur dialogue and then encourage you to engage with your representatives. That is probably the biggest thing I could recommend at the end of this is that there's, it's clear that we need to do something big and bold in my mind and doing that in a mindful and uh, thoughtful way as to how it will impact uh, actual healthcare delivery is important. All of you out there listening today have tremendous expertise and knowledge in this space that needs to be harnessed to craft a meaningful bill. And so I would hope that if you have strong opinions on any part of this and more, that you made those, make those known to your, uh, your representatives in Congress and elsewhere. And that I hope that we as a community of hackers can have meaningful policy conversations because we possess unique technical insights that often representatives don't. 
And so when they're drafting language and using particular uh, explanations of what, what particular controls can be, they can make mistakes. And us as hackers um, are experts at gaming systems. And we don't want that to be the case in something like this. We want something to be meaningful. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and say, send me any questions you have on Twitter. Um, and uh, if you have uh, any thoughts about something you'd like in policy, please send it my way. Uh, perhaps we could establish some type of forum and dialogue where we can collect all that. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. And again, thank you very much.